Welcome to our series, Fine Poetry. Poetry of a, a very unique character. We call it poems that touch deeper chords. And today, part five of C. Day Lewis. Again, I quote Porani on Day Lewis in the paragraph in which he mentions the revenant. There are many among modern writers who under the stress of life have given evidence of a capacity to rise to intuitive perception or inspired expression or psychic insight in their creation. There is a perception of the universal subjectivity on their part and it gives a new vision of nature, of the land and the sea and the earth and its objects, a new way of looking at human relations, a vision of the collectivity or of humanity, carrying altogether a new throb. And there is above all, in most of them, a perception of the supra-rational and a tendency to concretize, to objectivize, so to say, inner states or spiritual experiences. Among these poets may be counted C. Day Lewis. And I read this part again because it is so important. Now, Purani mentioned some others, George Barker, Stephen Spender, W. H. Auden, Peter Yates, Walter Allen, Edith Sidwell, David Gascoigne, J. A. Chadwick, alias Arjava, K. D. Setna, Siegfried Sassoon, Herbert Reed, to give only a few names out of the many. Of these writers, Day Lewis stands out as a very remarkable poet, embodying these inmost tendencies in the highest degree in his work. His Magnetic Mountain and some other works, which I had occasion to see in anthology, have given me a very great thrill of delight to see in them a surprisingly ample element of conscious, intuitive insight and expression. Some of his poems, notably The Poet, Word Over All, The Revenant, are all remarkable in the faithful rendering of the spiritual experience or insight. And we have already read The Poet and Word Over All, and now The Revenant. Out of the famous canyon, deeper than sleep, from the nerveless tarn of oblivion, she climbed. Dark was the slope, and her companion gave not one love glance back to brighten it. Only the wind-chafed rope of melody held her to him that hailed her lifeward praising the fire and delight in it. On the gist of that lay, or its burden, legend is dumb. How else, though, with love looks forbidden, could he say, come back to me, come? Could he touch the long-hidden spring of a shade, unfleshed, unfertilized, than by singing, O oh, crust and crumb, bark, sap, flesh, marrow, bro, life's all in the narrow ambit of sense flowering, immortalized, glimmering tall through the gloom in her phantom garment, life a daffodil 
when its stem feels trembling the first endearment of amorous bloom. She palely paused on the verge of light again. One step to break from her cerement. Yes, daffodil raid from the mold of the shade. No revenant now, a golden wife again. Had death become then already a habit too strong for her to break? The steady pulsing of Orpheus' song, though lightwards led he, grew faint in her. She wept for astonishment, feared she could never belong to life, be at home there, find aught but harm there, till that last step seemed less a birth than a banishment. What strand of his love was the weak one? Or how it befell that a song which could melt the dark one, death's granite lord with its spell, saved not this meek one, moved not his weak one to step from the last of her terrors. No man may tell. He felt the cord parting, the death wound smarting. He turned his head but to glimpse the ghost of her. So, as a pebble thrown from a cliff face, Soaring swerves back, less like a stone than a bird. Ere it falls to the snoring surf, she was gone. Reluctant her going, but the more bitterly mocked were his love is imploring that the gods spoke as seldom they speak on matters of life and death non-committally. And the last poem, Last Words. Suppose they asked, you are on your deathbed. Th this is just the game for a man of words. With what deliberate sentence will you sum and end your being? Last words, but which of me shall utter them? The child? who in London's infinite, intimate darkness, out of time's reach, heard nightly an engine whistle, remote and pure, as a call from the edge of nothing, and soon in the music of departure had perfect pitch. The romantic youth, for whom horizons were the daily round, near things unbiddable and inane as dreams, till he had learned, through his hoodwinked orbit of clay, what Eldorados lie close to hand. Or the aging man, seeing his lifelong travel and toil scaled down to a flimsy web, stranded on two dark boughs, dissolving soon, 
and only the vanishing dew makes visible now its haunted span. Let this man say, Blessed be the dew that graced my homespun web. Let this youth say, Prairies bow to the treadmill, do not weep. Let this child say, I hear the night bird, I can go to sleep.